And those of you who uh, signed up to this talk to hear Valerie talk uh, will notice that I am not Valerie, but I am honoured to be giving this talk on her behalf. So I'm, I'm Tanita, I'm the Head of Research Policy at the University of Glasgow and broadly speaking my responsibilities are to create the kind of environment in which researchers can succeed through policies, through activities, through projects uh, and so on. And we work very closely with Valerie and the library in that, not just in helping researchers to publish their work but also to raise their visibility and ultimately also to allow them to get credit for the work that they do. So that's what I'll be talking about in a few minutes, which is how we have implemented credit within our institutional system. But before that, I just wanted to go through the sort of context in which this project takes place. And so we, like others, are very interested in our research culture. Okay, so it's quite dangerous to sort of pluck words from the dictionary and expect everybody to know uh, what we mean. So by culture, we're not talking about the outputs of research or the inputs of research. What we're talking about is how research is done. And at Glasgow, we've defined it in three different dimensions. We define a positive research culture as one in which colleagues are recognised and valued for their varied contributions to a research activity. Okay, so whether a research project formally involves a team or not, it will probably involve input from people with different backgrounds, different expertise, different skills and different job families. And we want to be able to recognise that. We also want to create an environment in which colleagues support each other to succeed. Again, what kind of support, what kind of expertise or contacts or advice and wisdom can we give each other? And we also want to create an environment in which there's support to produce work that meets the highest standards of rigour. So are we producing work that is reliable, credible, trustworthy to not just our peers, but also to government and to the public? So that's how we define culture. Uh, but ultimately, nobody cares what Glasgow thinks, and I don't think you should care either, because ultimately what we do want to do is do what is aligned to what the sector is interested in. And so we have drivers as part of our own policy, but we also have drivers externally in the form of REF, which is interested in how our environment is shaping up from our funders. And we heard, I think, yesterday that the Wellcome Trust has launched a programme of research culture last month but also from uh, various surveys and concordats, looking at the experiences that our postgraduate researchers have in our institutions, and with regards to the careers concordat, how we are supporting early career researchers, and particularly postdocs, to succeed and get recognition for what they do and help that to help their careers. And a bit more recently as well, the technician commitment is a movement to raise the profile and support the career development of our technicians. Okay, so when it comes to recognising varied contributions, we have a programme of work, but the one that I'm talking about now is the one that applies to authorship. So how do we recognise and record the distinct roles that each collaborator makes to an output? And why do we want to do that? We want that first and foremost to improve our research practice. Okay, so we've got the right people in the paper, then we know that we have, we can avoid our disputes, we can avoid allegations of misconduct, we can avoid certain people um, hogging the credit and others uh, not receiving credit at all. We also want to improve research quality. Okay, credit with credit comes accountability, and that accountability comes with transparency as to who did what, and indirectly we think that also drives quality. We also want to support careers. If those who did the work are noted on the paper for what they actually did, uh, then they can be recognised for that. That is particularly important in multi-author papers for early career researchers with authors with specialised roles, such that their work can come to the attention of their peers, to promotion panels, to prize committees, and so on. But we also want to support our researchers to be future-proofed against the future format of scholarly communications. Okay, so... Uh, articles as uh, so a research in the future or outputs of the future will not be article shaped. It's important that those who do stuff are recognised in association with what they actually did. And we also think that the traditional um, concept of or definition of authorship is going out of fashion. Um, it becomes impossible, I think, for every author to be both um, uh, attributed to uh, to have both intellectual contribution or practical contribution, as well as having critically read the manuscript. And so this is a kind of a scenario that we would um, typically encounter, but even with a group of six researchers, there's no way of telling by their order or by their position or by whatever uh, as to what they actually did and what they are doing there. So what we're doing at Glasgow is implementing the credit taxonomy to define the contributions that a researcher has made, or indeed any other contributor has made, to an output. So you probably have heard of credit, but if you haven't, then it's a set of 14 rules and descriptors that can be used to um, represent and describe the contributions that a researcher has made 
to the scientific scholarly output. Okay, and the list is here. You won't be able to read them all, but essentially there are 14 rules with a one or two word descriptor and then a sentence of explanation. So one type of rule might be data curation, supervision, visualization, writing the manuscript, validation, and so on. And what this does is simplify the, um, simplify the process of discussing with co-authors who did what, with each contributor, of course, being able to have more than one contribution. So credit has been around for a while. It's been implemented by dozens of various uh, different platforms and including institutions, including the University of Glasgow. So what does that mean in terms of embedding it into our system? Uh, we have had mentioned credit in our code of good research practice for a couple of years now. So when defining authorship, authors are encouraged to express in a clear manner the contribution they've made to the published work, uh, especially in the publication itself where this is permitted and use um, the credit taxonomy to do that. Also, uh, we've embedded it into our strategic recruitment schemes. So if you're applying to one of the recruitment schemes at Glasgow, we will ask applicants to list their four most important papers, what the significance of the work is, and what the contribution of that author is in, uh, in, 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 in credit terms. So this is an example of what happens to one of our papers. This is one of our papers published from Glasgow in PLOS One. And you'll see that if you expand each of the, uh, of the author data, it'll have both the usual affiliation and email address. And then increasingly, it will also have uh, the roles themselves described there, as many roles as that individual has had. Here's another paper published in the Welcome Open Research platform. Same thing applies, slightly different format, where the author affiliations are then followed by the name and roles of those particular authors. And this is the interface that an author has when selecting the contributions that they have made to a particular manuscript, name, surname, whether they're a corresponding author, and then checking as many boxes uh, as, are, uh, as are relevant to indicate the role that they have had. And so we have taken uh, this very simple model and implemented it within our outputs repository, which is called Enlighten. So where a publisher implements credit, we will actually transfer that information into our repository. Uh, and so essentially just name, surname, and a drop-down list of one of the 14, um, the 114 descriptors. And there are as many rows per author as there are uh, contributions from that author. And there may also be cases, as in this one here, where the author does not implement credit. And this is actually a paper that Valerie herself had authored and sent into the publisher with author contributions and they were stripped out. And so they were reinserted then into our repository in the normal manner. So what do we say that authors at Glasgow should do? They should capture for each of the authors the agreed um, uh, credit descriptor. Each of the authors agrees that it's provided to the publisher and if the publisher does not uh, request roles then we include that in the narrative of the paper and if the publisher does not include it in the paper we will then put it on our repository. So what happens next for credit itself? They are going to be updating the definitions so that they are applicable to, um, to more disciplines. So even though those 14 descriptors that they currently have are fairly wide ranging, they are slightly STEM biased. So how do we capture, for example, those who have curated an exhibition. They wish to expand them to other output types. Some other organisations have expanded them even further to indicate the type of or the level of contribution that an author has made, for example, whether they've led on that particular role, shared or assisted. Personally, I think this is probably a step too far for this particular stage, given that we haven't embedded uh, the basic descriptors. Uh, there's a possibility of hiring a community manager, a bit like Dora, so again, making that interaction with CASRI um, uh, a little bit easier. And there's also discussions with Crossref and Data Site as to whether they will uh, embed it as well. For us, what we would really like is to be able to have data automatically from publishers rather than having to do it manually. We work with our researchers from different disciplines to meet requirements and again also externally to, to, to communicate those and communicate them to CASRI. Uh, but in the immediate term, it would be useful to see whether or not this approach helps us with, uh, with our submission to the Research Excellence Framework. This is the National Assessment Framework for Research Quality in the UK. And the audit guidance for that submission process basically says that we must demonstrate that, that an author in one of our submitted manuscripts has had a substantial research contribution, made a substantial research contribution to that paper. And it also says that in, when we are submitting outputs from the sciences, then the author the contribution statement within the paper supersedes anything that we might provide to REF separately. So if you want to know more about credit, then there's a paper that was published earlier this year, um, which uh, summarises it, but also presents the status, state of the art and next steps. There's a website. We're happy to speak to people. And also there's an opportunity to join the interest group at CASRI. And in the spirit of practising what we preach, this is the people who provided resources, ideas and inspiration for this talk and this project. Thank you.
thank you very much for that breakneck speed. <laughs> you gave me 12 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes ago, basically, right. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Yep, over here. Um, you were... Okay. You were uh, sorry. You were talking at the beginning um, uh, very generally about research outputs, which was great. But then, when you got into all the details, suddenly you only were talking about papers. Yes. And and so I would go back to the a couple of slides earlier where you talked about extensions to Casper for disciplines. Um, the the credit model doesn't apply really to software products or data products either. So it's mm -hmm. it's not just that it needs to be extended for more disciplines. It needs to be extended. I I think for more kinds of products. And so I'm, I'm wondering, is that something that you know of? Is that going to happen? Is that part of the plan? I believe it is. And that's why I, mean, I included it on the slide and didn't read it out. Uh, we would love to be able to do that. I think, um, you know, I think institutions are a, a sort of half a step behind, I think, the sector. So we're not at any risk of sort of taking, taking over that. Um, we have to start with embedding this as a notion and then others will come to us and go, we want that for us as well. And if the sector is in, has planned to provide it, then by the time they ask us, it'll be there. And that's probably not. But it, it's a difficult thing with, among all the other things that researchers need to do to communicate. From a library perspective, speaking for the library and from a research policy perspective, we would love to be able to do that. And we very much hope we will be able to do that soon. Okay, any other questions? Over here. Oh, uh, yeah, we'll do both of these and then we'll move on. I, I'd like hey. to ask a question in, for the researchers. 14 categories is already a lot to process. So do what, how to get the balance between having it um, very precise and, uh, but still usable by the researchers? How do you tackle that problem? I mean, you you think there are many, many think they need more because they're not precise enough. Because ultimately, if you have, um, you know, either the, there are things missing that are not captured by the existing one, or the existing one has to be shared among many others because effectively, they did, so nobody gets sing, single credit for that particular activity because by necessity, the range of activities that a particular category covers means that it has to cover other other people as well. Um, so I don't really know the answer to your question. I think that depending on the discipline, it might matter more or less that there are only or as many as 14 uh, categories. Okay. And last question. Um, my question is about um, non-author contributions. So I understand that your focus has been mainly on contributions of authors, but for instance, um, the definition that is provided by the ICMJE might not necessarily coincide with someone's contributions. Writing, drafting is uh, one of the 14 roles one might have had a substantial contribution to data collection yeah. without having made the contribution to um, drafting or revising. How is it also part of your um, plan to include non-author contributions into what you're yeah, yeah, and it's not even just my plan. I mean, the, 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 the idea of having contributor roles is that we move away from actually in practical definitions of authorship, which are becoming less practical because of the multi-author and specialised nature of many contributions, where each individual author cannot possibly even have contributed to the draft, never mind defend the entire paper. So I would say that authorship and contribution ought not to be coincident, and that's not how we are promoting them. So we are changing the definition of authorship to contribution. Are you planning to also collect non-author contributions? Well, so for example, having only written but not done anything else, or having collected data but not anything else, yes, I would say yes, that, that counts as a contributor and therefore listed as an author. I might not understand the new question. Someone who's not listed as an author, let's yeah. say someone who's being acknowledged, would you also collect that kind of contribution? So if somebody is currently acknowledged, then there would be, so they, wouldn't, they might not be an author, but they might have a, def a contribution against them in the acknowledgement. If you're asking whether somebody who is currently only going to be acknowledged would become an author, no, in that case, the, the previous apply. Yes, I think we should also, when somebody is, has contributed but not contributed to the extent that they are in the author list, we should be seeing what they did. Okay. And that might apply to technical staff, for example, as I was saying in one of my points. Uh, well, thank you very much again. That's okay.